It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live! Woohoo! Oh, I forgot to open the chat room today. Anyway, today we're going to do questions with our head screener here at Taxi, Mr. Craig Pilo. Oh, this says I'm not live. Let's see what's going on. Hold uh -huh. on. We have to do the intro again? Uh, I don't know yet. Hang on a second. Are we live, Eric? Well, yeah, he shouldn't. We're live. I can't tell. I don't have the chat room open yet. YouTube Studio. Hang on, everybody, just in case you're there and I'm not. I'm going to. Uh, I know why. I forgot to click something. Oh, Liz says I am live. All right. Well, that's good to know. Uh, let me get the chat room open. I've forgotten how to do this. It's been a little while. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Why can I not find? There we go. Uh, Liz, come back in here for a second, please. I do uh -oh. not. Technical difficulties. Yeah, I don't know. Um, stream now, do not use. Man, technical difficulties, always a problem. Are we live, Eric? Are you seeing us? I am. Because I'm not getting the chat. I actually clicked on something and I'm seeing stream now, do not use. I don't know how to get out of this. Um, Everybody okay, well, tell alive. everybody, go in the chat room. Just tell them I'm straightening them out okay. some chat. Yeah, we can hear you and everything's good. Awesome. I love making a fool of myself in front of a crowd of people. I do that so well. Hang in there, everybody. I'll be right with you. I've got to solve a little technical difficulty. Okay, that's there. Why am I not seeing the chat? I can't find the chat. I can't really do it without the chat. Um, Are you seeing it? YouTube, your channel. I got it, I got it, I got it. The stream. I keep getting a chat, but yeah, it's I'm the wrong chat. I'm having a problem. All right, well, I'm going to do it without the chat for right now, and then you guys can just send Liz questions, and she'll bring them in to me. How's that? So hello, everybody. Uh, I am getting out of there. Hello, Craig. How are you? <laughs> Good. Everything okay? Yeah, well, it kind of is. Uh, for some reason, I'm having problems with the seeing the YouTube chat on my end, but that's okay. Yeah, um, I don't see the chat in, in here either. But. Well, you shouldn't, but uh, yeah. you and I are broadcasting. Hello, everybody that I can't see in the chat room. Welcome to the big show today. So today we are going to relay some questions from you guys to our head screener, Mr. Craig Pilo. Um, Craig has been in the industry for longer than he probably wants to admit. Uh, first and foremost, he's a world-class drummer that plays really big sessions and has played on tour with a lot of great people. Um, and he's got music and production music libraries. He's done some music supervision. So all those things came together. And he was teaching full-time before, which he's not anymore. So we were able to snag him to make him our head screener several months ago. And we're glad that he's here. Yeah, the audience will love it. Me too. Well, we love having you here. Um, so let's just jump right in and... Let's start with the first question from Pierre Venio. 
What would be the main giveaway that a track is too MIDI sounding? How can you tell it's too quantized? Well, being a drummer and the head screener, you should be able to answer this really well. Uh, okay, like I have a feeling like a lot of these are gonna go. The first answer is always gonna be, it will depend on the references. So if the references have like all live musicians and it's got a very live sound and um, it either sounds like it was recorded live or tracked with live musicians, uh, that's going to be your first point of reference. So anything that is like created VST or with loops or in the box, as we would say, and then right. submitted to a live sounding listing, listing that out of the gate is starting out with like two strikes against you. Um, so as far as the threshold for what's too MIDI and what's too VST, I mean, if you're doing pop and hip hop, I mean, all of that's programmed. So it doesn't it comes into play less in certain genres. But if like you're submitting to a jazz or a funk listing or maybe a Latin listing or or something where it really requires live live players, specifically percussion, like percussion can be a big offender in those categories. Uh, and there are guys who can program it very, very well. But we had talked about this before. You want to try to avoid just downloading a loop and using it like at the very least produce it a little bit or change it for the sake of changing it and maybe layer in some other sounds it's always good to layer in some live elements even if you are losing a, a loop to give you more of a a live sound right um so can you suggest some changes people are probably freaking out going well uh that sounds really hard what do i do can you give them some easy changes that they can uh, effectuate to change up a loop or to take some vst drums and make them not sound like they're out of the box and all stiff yeah i'm not a big fan of uh there are great vst drum programs obviously the stephen slate stuff and the um you know i know people use addictive drums and there's there's the um the big epic drum program that everybody uses those are all great but within the context of whatever it is that the supervisor or your, one of your clients is looking for. Um, as far as getting a live sound, it really needs to be live. It's really hard to duplicate that. What about just adding some humanity into it? You know, I mean, there's one thing, yeah, trying to make it sound live, live. I mean, and I don't know if you're talking live like a show or live like played it in the studio or just adding humanity back to um, some VST stuff. Do you have any suggestions on I that? I mean, there's a bunch of ways to do it in the box. I, I try to avoid all of it, but like certainly you can mess with the, with all the quantized buttons, you're gonna have a swing factor. You can move that slider up and maybe add a little swing factor. That'll move your eighth notes to less of a 16th note pattern and more of a triplet pattern. So that can give you the illusion that not everything is metronomically perfect to the nano hundredth of a 30 second note or whatever. <laughs> so if you kind of play with the swing factor a little bit, sometimes that'll move the notes. And, and then Tom was also talking about some sort of randomization program where you can select 32 or 64 bars and it'll do something to make all the velocities a little bit different. So it's not so um, square as well. I'm not as familiar with that, but I know each, I know that can also be DAW specific as well. So um, also just adding uh this is something I've suggested, even though I've never actually done, but I've suggested it to people and gotten really good feedback, which is just adding a shaker, a tambourine, um, a conga part, anything you can do with your hands that won't be perfectly quantized. Absolutely. That sits in with the quantized stuff and makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on to the next one. Um, this is an interesting one. This one's from taxi member Ron Svoboda, and he's got several questions here, a couple of them anyway. Number one is, could there be a way for the screeners to listen to the submissions without knowing who submitted them? If I send a concern to Craig, meaning you, the head screener, um, would I be shooting myself in the foot? Uh, Ron, you need to take some medication for that paranoia. <laughs> I'm kidding, but um, seriously, I think you're overthinking it, Ron. But go ahead and answer the question. I'll repeat it again. Could there be a way for the screeners to listen to submissions without knowing who submitted them? And I'm curious why Ron wants to know that. But, yeah, I'm okay. curious what the benefit would be to that, uh, implying that the screeners would forward or hold something back based on who it was. I, I, I mean, having been a screener for, what, three years before I was in here, 
Mm -hmm. I, I would vouch for all the screeners sight unseen that nobody would forward or return anything based on the name or account that it's associated with. Um, I mean, if anything, I think I, f I found myself rooting for certain people sometimes when I was screening, like, ah, they finally got this and, oh, the ending was good, or they finally realized that these durations matter and they didn't submit an eight minute cue to something that needed to be 90 <laughs> seconds. It's right. like, ah, they finally did it. You know, their music's good and they, they, they took away all the reasons for us to return it, which is exactly what the clients are doing. They're just sitting there listening to the playlist and we say, okay, now it's four minutes. I need a 90 seconds. Nope. Delete that. Okay. Oh, uh, the ending was cut off too short. Delete that. And so I, I, I would va venture to say that no screener would ever have any type of bias based on the account or the name associated with it. I, I would find that hard to believe probably even if correct me if I'm wrong, that would, that would sound to me like a fireable offense almost. Right. Oh, absolutely. It would. And you're right. I think if anything, there might be people want to think of the screeners as gatekeepers, like they're there to right. protect right. the castle and keep you out when actually right. they're all all musicians. They're all lovers of music. And if anything, right. they're cheerleaders for the taxi members. So you're right. They may see somebody whose music over the last year and a half hasn't been quite up to snuff. And finally, they make the grade. Yeah, they would like be thrilled to, to forward that. Um, Wow, it's. I think that Ron just Ron. Honestly, I think you're overthinking this. That the screeners don't go. Oh, it's that guy again. I'm not going to forward him. I mean, if anything, it's the opposite of that. No, They're hoping yeah. that you do something really right and get it forwarded. Yeah. Um. Okay, I could see the chat now. By the way, guys, but we've got a bunch of questions on paper before I get to the stuff in the chat. So give us a few before you start firing any questions. Um. Yeah, give me a chance. Oh, right. Uh, and, and no, you know, if you send a question to the head screener, it's not like the head screener sends out an email to, you know, 25, 30 screeners on that day saying, okay, everybody who's screening this month, make sure that you don't forward anything from Ron's Foboda because he's a pain in my butt. It's just not the way it goes around here. <laughs> See, Craig's yeah, I laughing. Would. I would uh, rest assured that uh, they take no consideration to the name or account is completely irrelevant. Uh, everything's screened primarily based on the listing criteria and nothing else really matters. It's just uh, everything is one on one client specific, uh, you know, so yeah, those kinds of things aren't going to aren't going to factor in at all. Um, yeah, it, it's. Man, I've been here for 30 years, and, and I've never, ever had to deal with a screener that was like blacklisting somebody or blackballing somebody. It just doesn't, uh, just doesn't go that way. Anyway, uh, all right, and Ron's second question is, I get very few negative checks on the boxes, but they always seem to find something that I may disagree with, meaning he, the guy generating this question, Ron Svoboda, disagrees with. Do the screeners actually read the entire listing and listen to the reference tracks as I do? They better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's what that's they're using the same criteria. Uh, you know, the and, and this is with a lot of the complaints that we get, and I get it after the fact, oh my cue is, is awesome, but it was returned and your screeners don't know anything. It's you know, and then I just pull up I just pull up the listing and I be it. I mean, even when I was a screener, uh, you know, I would go back and revisit the references at least a couple times during a shift uh, per listing just to refresh my own ears as far as what the client wanted. So yeah, the the screeners live, breathe, and die by the references in the listing and the and the brief, the words in the brief, the verbiage in the in the brief. They 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 use that's the criteria they use right there. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a really common misconception that the screeners will forward something because they like it or not forward it because they don't like it. No, I mean, their personal taste, things they like, have nothing to do. That's why they're professionals, is they know to not infuse their own likes or dislikes into the decision of getting forwarded or not. It's, does it yeah. work for this listing? Wow. Somebody said that uh, there was a complaint uh, a few weeks. Actually, not a complaint. I got to be fair. A lot of times people just write to me and go, hey, could you give this another listen? I think it's wrong, but whatever, you know, like and, and most of the time people are pretty most members have been pretty cooperative, at least since I've been here. Uh, somebody did say somebody did mention, uh, 
I can't remember the exact words, but somebody did say, well, it's just an opinion or it doesn't matter. Or one screen, one screener might forward it and another might return it. It's all a matter of opinion. And I'm like, no, no, it's no, it's not like you said, like nine wrong things in that one in that one paragraph to me. It's And they weren't trying to be offensive. They just didn't know. They were just saying, well, you know, what well, one screener might forward, another might return. That's, and that's that's not true. It's they're all using the same parameters on that particular listing. Now, what might have been a forward for another listing might not be a forward for this and vice versa. But it's not it's not really as subjective as what everybody thinks. And, and most of the time when people uh, want a second listen, I, I got to say, like, probably 95 percent of the time, the, the screener's original critique is right. I mean, once in a while, things get mixed up and we have to go a little bit deeper with the evaluation. But I think for the most part, the screeners are very consistent. And I have a hard time believing that an opinion, a name, an account, or anything would factor into whether it's forwarded or returned. I didn't, the screener didn't get enough coffee that morning. Maybe yeah, right, right, right. his or her spouse was a little right. cranky with them and things right. aren't going so. Their blood sugar's a little low. <laughs> right. Their sporting team, the Dodgers lost. Ah, you know. <laughs> God no. forbid the Dodgers lost. No, that's funny. Um, okay, so he goes on to say, uh, and yes, the screeners do listen. And, and Craig mentioned the, in their shift, they never work more than four hours. Uh, because you do get burnout after four hours. I actually yeah. set that time limit myself because I was one of the first screeners at Taxi. After four hours, you're like enough already. So that's why we capped it at four hours. Um, Ron it's gave like a couple. Airline, of, what, 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 the FAA. What are the like the people that land the airplanes? Don't they do like a similar thing? They only work for a certain amount of time. Yeah, right. speaking of which, I was coming home on a flight a week ago, a little more than a week ago, and uh, I have a friend who sadly passed away a couple weeks ago, but he was a pilot for uh, an airline that flies between Los Angeles and the Middle East, and he sent a bunch of us who are part of a chat group, those of us who fly remote control airplanes, he sent us videos of the pilot's secret compartment underneath the floor of the galley and the cockpit, and that's where the pilots go sleep after four hours or six hours or whatever their time limit is. And it was really cool. It's like there are two beds on the side and kind of like a, a split twin in the middle. And I thought, well, that's cool. No windows, but yeah, a little reading light, little air vent, you know, uh, probably no flight attendant serving coffee down there, but they can go right. crash. Anyway, so I was on the flight coming home eight or nine days ago, and I was standing in the galley waiting for somebody to come out of a restroom, and I was chit-chatting with the flight attendants. All of a sudden, a panel between the floor and like my waist, you know, it was like a two foot panel slides up and a pilot comes crawling out of the floor. It's, well, apparently that's where they were sleeping. Anyway, enough of that. No more airline stuff on this show because it's a music show. Um, so Ron gave a, an example here. Um, and this example doesn't really even make sense with his last question, frankly. I get very few negative checks on the boxes, but they always seem to find something that I may disagree with. So then he goes on to say, for a country song, the comment was, this needs a stronger chorus. If he, meaning the screener, I presume, read my lyrics submitted, he could tell there wasn't even a chorus in the song. It was simply a refrain. Um, and and well, this was one they had... There. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it was a refrain, not a chorus. There is a difference. Uh, and he also says there were no reference tracks in this listing because it was one of the road rally listings where we weren't looking for stuff to be similar to references. He gives another example here for a track behind a TV commercial. The request said, uh, piano should be the main focus and base of your arrangement, but additional instrumentation like strings, pad synthesizers, etc., are fine as well. And the screener's comment was, it would also help to get the strings more involved. The very low level makes them a very minor player in the overall sound. We could use them to our advantage for sure to help the cue grow and progress. Um, so he says he wanted the audience to keep their focus, he meaning Ron the member, wanted to keep the audience's focus on the speaker, meaning the, the voice over the dialogue, I guess, and not the background music. There were also two breaks in the instrumental for them to pick and choose which parts were needed. So, and he comments on, you know, a piano should be the main focus, and the screener said, your strings aren't, uh, let's see, uh, get the strings more involved, talks about the level. Any feelings on that one? 
I mean, I'd have to re-examine the listing from top to bottom to see exactly what's going on there because it wasn't a really general question. That one sounds like something we'd get under the hood a little bit more and be specific. It sounds to me like it was an orchestration issue where like the levels just weren't cohesive. But again, without listening to the exact references in that specific listing, it'd be really hard to make an educated guess on that. Um, you know, when you submit something where they say the piano needs to be the primary instrument, um that would mean that that needs to be center stage and you just don't want the strings to be louder or covering up the piano or horns or some synths or whatever or percussion or anything like that um but that said you also don't want to be like wow what do i hear in the background is that a you know it still has to be right. like <laughs> blended and audible you know it still needs to sound like music you know so and i would imagine the references would have been a great point for that and since they're not in front of me i can't really i don't know it might be premature to say anything on that one yeah, but Ron, feel free to um, reach out to headscreener at taxi.com so that Craig can check that out if you'd like any further information on that. Uh, this next one is from Jesse Skelton, and I kind of want to take this one because there may be information in here that you don't actually know yet because you haven't been here for Great. 15 or 20 years. Um, are there special screeners for taxi dispatch? There used to be special screeners for taxi dispatch, but we haven't had it that way in many, many years. In the beginning, dispatch, we used to run listings. They would get published on the 1st and 15th of every month. Now we publish listings every day because they're just coming in so rapidly, we have to. So back when we published on the 1st and 15th of every month, we would publish, we would get film and TV requests that were much faster turnaround than the 30, 60, and 90 day record label and publisher listings. So we created this thing to take care of the film and TV side of things called Taxi Dispatch. We had a person that ran it uh, like kind of like a business within a business. It had its own office, its own little staff, uh, and there were screeners that were qualified to do film and TV work only back then. They weren't record guys. They weren't uh, radio, you know, songs, hit songs for radio guys. They were people that knew film and TV music. Over time, the whole industry started leaning much more towards film and TV, and the turnaround times became shorter than 30, 60, 90 days. And so we just, we were going to get rid of Taxi Dispatch, but we did a survey with some of our members, um, some of our most hardcore members, actually, and they were like, no, don't get rid of Dispatch. And we said, well, in good conscience, we can't really, it's not anything special anymore because so much of what we do is film and TV related and we publish listings on a daily basis and the deadlines are usually shorter. So they said, well, we don't want to lose the instrumental listing. So can you make dispatch mostly about instrumental? So that's what we did. We just did what the members asked us to do. Um, and we don't have special screeners for it anymore because the screeners are doing instrumental tracks for regular taxi listings as well as dispatch. So hopefully uh, that answers that. And what kind? he goes on to say, what kind of extra services are provided with dispatch? I think I just explained what it used to be and what it is now. And quite frankly, now it is just um, mostly instrumental requests. Um, and it could be from libraries, could be from a particular show, doesn't really matter. And frankly, uh, we've talked about this for a while. First, we had COVID that prevented us from raising the price. We didn't want to, you know, we haven't raised the price on taxi in 30 years. And you can imagine how our costs have gone up, not to mention the inflation that's going on right now. But leaving inflation out of it, just talking about how much, you know, the cost of a house has gone up in 30 years, cost of a car, food, gasoline, all that stuff. And we've not raised the price of taxi. So our margins have gone from fair margins down to less to less to less down to the margins, frankly, aren't that strong anymore. And so we want to get back to a healthy uh, profit margin so the company stays healthy. So all that considered, we have been talking now for a good two years about raising the price. There is a price increase on the horizon that's coming. Um, I don't know how much it's going to be. We keep toggling between two numbers, but I'd say there's a reasonable chance the taxi dispatch will be rolled into regular taxi. So let's say the price goes up 50 or 100 bucks a year. Uh, you're going to now get dispatch, which has um, been $150 upsell or upcharge or addition to. So you guys still win. You're going to get something worth 150 bucks for either 50 or 100 bucks. 
So, and people, by the way, who've signed up for Dispatch um, and have time left on their Dispatch membership, we will prorate that so that nobody gets uh, screwed, for lack of a better word. We don't like to screw our members. Uh, so Jesse goes on to ask, um, if I've made connections with three successful movie directors, is there a top 10 type of track I should be expected to provide as a portfolio when asked? Ooh. Hmm. Want me to repeat that one? Uh, no, I think I got it. Uh, what should I be expected to provide? So, in other words, if you got in with three separate movie directors, what would they most commonly ask for? Is that the question? Well, it's not really what would they commonly ask for so much as what should I commonly provide them? Um, you, know, you know, uh, I would just provide whatever you're good at and, and, and stick with what you know, uh, because three separate movies are going to require three completely separate, you know, genres of music. I mean, one might be a period piece shot in the seventies. One might be on location somewhere and require some ethnic music. You know, if it's shot in Mexico or Africa or Brazil or something, you're going to want something instrument specific for that. Um, the the moods, you know, depending on on what it is, is it uh, a jukebox musical remake? Is it a dramatic piece? Is it is a suspenseful thriller. Is it an action movie? So, like doing a lot of work in advance, maybe it'll save you some time. But I found with movies, it's very very specific, and that's why they hire music supervisors a lot to fill in the gaps when they need something specific for what they have going on on picture. I mean, the music in that situation, 90% of the time is to support what's going on in the movie. So, I mean, I guess doing some research is never a bad thing, but I think trying to create music in preparation of what somebody might ask for, you might wait until the, the more specific parameters become available. Yeah, they could check out uh, Variety's website or IMDb Pro, and they might see something that says, you know, John Doe has a green light to make this film about Abraham Lincoln's long lost and unknown brother. So right. there you go. You're so what music kind of from the 1850s, and you know, right. probably uh, you know, Civil War type type of whatever was going on then, and then do some research for that, but. You know, as far as like loading up, yeah, I don't know. That that's a tough one to answer too, because it certainly doesn't hurt to go back and look for common threads among movies what they what they use. But I'm not I'm not sure there isn't a better use of your time to just yeah. Like if you saw that Cameron Crowe was making a movie, not that he uses independent artists very much. He almost always uses hits of the mid '70s or something. But yeah, Cameron Crowe is a guy that. Um, almost always uses like classic rock stuff uh, yeah. in his films because that's the era that he loved and, and grew up with. And so, yeah, you could predict that. Yeah, you, and, you know, Quentin Tarantino has a sound and, you know, so you certainly, you know, the Ocean's Eleven movies all have a sound and stuff. So, I mean, you could do that. But, uh, you know, again, that's just you're still kind of playing darts with what the director or producer might ask you for, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Let's see what else. Uh, Jesse had another question here. Is using SoundCloud to show my portfolio seen as professional to the industry? I have no idea. I mean, if somebody needs a, if somebody, if a music supervisor needs a piece of music, they'll search high and low to get it. So, uh, I, I, what is the question? Whether SoundCloud is like an industry standard? I, I don't yeah, I know. think that's I, what he's saying is if somebody sees you've got your portfolio up on SoundCloud, do they go, oh, we must be professional? Um, I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't really rely too much on the source. Again, I tend to listen to the music, you know, I mean, right. uh, I, I don't I don't know if the platform matters as much as people think. So. Uh, I think one thing that probably does matter is don't send them a 10 minute reel of your music as an attachment to an email. They yeah, will send that. a hit squad to your house and yeah. take you out. And you'll get blocked and you won't, you won't be able to right. email them anymore. <laughs> yeah, nobody likes to download stuff, could have viruses. They don't want to clog up their hard drive. It'll get lost on their desktop. Uh, a million reasons like that. Okay, and the last question from Jesse. He was very busy, had a lot of questions for you. Yeah. Have you ever used non-band members or non-musicians? Oh, this is a great question. Have you ever used non-band members or non-musicians, people that just love to watch videos as screeners? And if not, 
Why not? Uh, you, you want me? I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, go, I think this yeah. is a good one for you, but I'll go ahead and do it. I, well, I, you I answer it, like, I'll chime in. Uh, yeah, I just don't like the, you know, I, I, I would think that, that, that you'd want musicians and music experts to screen. And not that anybody here is judging anybody or anything. I mean, and, and you certainly don't need a degree in music to be ses- successful at it. But, uh, you know, you do want more than somebody who has logic and a membership to splice uh, to, to be doing production music. And, and you do want industry professionals, people that have succeeded and have a track record in an industry to keep the quality where it needs to be. Um, you know, you had a good example earlier. I'll let you repeat that. But uh, I, I would think that everybody the in, on both sides, members and the industry, wouldn't want, you know, armchair or backseat drivers for this. <clears throat> I think, you know, I, I, not to start a beef here, and I don't want to start a big thing in the chat room either, but I, I've never really been a big fan of, of, of like, American Idol. You know, uh, because I, I don't like when the music industry itself gets its music history from a TV show. You know, there's right. a big, long reason for why music is the way it is and all these wonderful genres. And, and you study that. And, you know, I studied it when I went to music school. But I, I just don't like, like, you know, the prophet Simon Cowell saying what's good and what's not. And then and then a whole generation of youth gets their information from from American Idol. I just I just think music's deeper than that and it should be explored by by people with a little bit more knowledge than that. Um, again, I'm not attacking anybody or anybody's background or anybody's resume, but I'm just saying I would think that both members and the industry alike would want us to be solid music professionals for the situation we have here. That specifically, no. Like a, a lot of people I don't think are aware of the fact that Taxi has screeners that are really solid on the radio and record side that might be really good at, um, let's say, country or pop or hip hop or whatever. But we typically don't use them on the film and TV stuff because there are different rules for what makes music work in film and TV than radio and record. So somebody who's got a great ear for picking hits can't necessarily and probably won't pick the right music for a scene in a movie because they're not thinking like a director or a producer working on a show. They're thinking like, that's a great frickin' song. Or that sounds like a hit. Man, I can't stop singing that chorus. Well, in in a movie, you may not want that because if the song's that good, it's going to pull the the viewer's attention away from the dialogue or the action Mm -hmm. or or the storyline. So we actually go beyond just having people that are professionals. They're professionals with specific attributes and and beyond their specific genres that they're good at. They're either film and TV or their records. There's some that have crossed over only because the industry has largely crossed over and they've had to follow and learn that drill. But we test them. We, We watch them like a hawk to make sure that they are picking the right music and giving the right feedback. And boy, um, I tell you, you you have some fantastic screeners here. Like people that I'm just, I learned from them as well. Uh, they're both good people, and they really know music well. And some of the comments they make, because I get I get to read a lot of the comments, and I have to proofread what they write, and I see what they write sometimes. I'm like, oh wow, they this was a perfect analogy of what this person did right and what they did wrong. And I'm like, I wish I would have had some of these people looking over my shoulder 14 years ago when I brought my awful music to friend of mine and he said you know you could you could get into sync you could be really good at this but you know fix this this and this and this and this and this and 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 what what your screeners are doing now is they're doing a remarkable job of giving precise actionable things that can make music better and um i appreciate that for your members i wish i had known about it 15 years ago i would have been a member but uh um they're they're all really top notch like all of the ones all, all the screeners do a fantastic job Let's talk about that more. You know, I don't know. uh, Last time I had you on the show, I think we were listening to music and commenting. But why don't you tell people kind of what your day is like and what the head screener does and tell them how you feel about the screeners. And and yeah, give us five minutes on what the head screener is all about. Well, I'll tell you what, the last time I was on, uh, can I say the screeners names or not? They were on Taxi TV with me, right? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I was on with Paul Taylor and Joe Brandt. And um I mean, Paul Taylor's history with, you know, he's a he's a great conductor and a great orchestrator and a great writer. 
And he basically takes time out of his day to comment and help young, uh, you know, people in those in those orchestral genres. And he's just he's nails. I mean, he's really good. And then another uh, another screener, uh, David Bowick, uh, does such a great job. Same kind of thing, like just very articulate with what's oh, okay. You went to an F sharp here, you know, good, just really like getting into the guts of the chords that maybe the voice leading wasn't quite right, or the. Uh, and you've got Joe Brandt, who's got um, who. Uh, his brothers have a library, and so he's been a music supervisor. He does a lot of music curating, so he deals with a lot of genres. He knows a lot about sync in general, um, and you know, to to watch those guys work and to see how precise they are about what needs to be improved and what's not is fantastic. But anyway, my job when I come in is I usually uh, check my email, see if there's any major complaints about a screener. If there is, I try to address that right away. And it, 99% of the time I tell people, just read the listing again and you'll figure out everything I'm probably gonna say to you. That's 99% of what I do. Um, and then I'll check um, a lot of the music that's forwarded to me before I send it to your clients. Um, and I'll make sure that the forwards are good. Most of the time they're great. Um, there's not much for me to do there. Usually by the screeners do all the work there. I just kind of double check and provide another layer of protection to make sure we're given the keeping the quality bar as high as you want to keep it and everything. I should um, add something to that, which is, you know, for the people think, oh, somebody didn't have enough coffee or had a fight with his or her spouse. That's you're looking for them coming off their normal mark. In other words, if you know a screener is an A plus screener and all of a sudden they're doing C plus work, you'll catch that. That's part of well, what no, right do. away. Yeah. And you know, like I said, and, and it, new it, screeners too. By the way, when, mm -hmm. when we're breaking in new screeners, you're watching them very closely. Sorry, yeah. I stepped on either. Yeah, no, and I just you know I check what they say, and we all we all monitor everything. But like most of the time, it's just it's it's really it's really excellent. You know, it's really and uh, and we're able to keep the nice the quality bar nice and high, which I think is important for both. And I again, it's not it doesn't mean that we return more music. What it means is that we keep the quality bar high so that the clients keep coming back for more music, which gives you more opportunity to run more listings. So we have to send them the best of the best stuff or it hurts everybody. It hurts the clients. It hurts the members. So I try to provide a level of quality control where I just make sure that everything is nails before we before it gets forwarded. And most of the time I don't have to do much. The screeners do all the heavy lifting. Um, so after that, I will start. We, we do a team effort putting together a top 10 each month. So uh, I mostly curate that, and then we pass it around for a second, third, fourth opinion before it gets finalized. But um, yeah, the Taxi Top 10, I deal with a, a few complaints here and there. The complaints have been pretty low this month, so thank all of you guys who are watching for not <laughs> complaining too much. It's been great. I've been able to get more work done. So, uh, and then what else? I'm trying to think, what else do I do? That, believe it or not, is, is a pretty, uh, pretty full-time job. Um, you also prep for the uh, A and R meetings every two weeks. Tom is our head of A and R, senior director yes. of A and R, yeah. so he organizes a meeting with um, Craig, uh, with Annie who writes the listings, with Eric who takes care of scheduling the screeners and making sure workflow is going well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those meetings, I think members would be surprised. You know, we watched, we actually look at the screeners. Has anybody, uh, you know, gone off the reservation? Uh, anybody's, we don't tell them, by the way, that you have to do X number per hour. We like the, the rule of thumb is we'd like them to break even. If somebody is going so slowly that we lose money on them, then Craig will talk with them and say, can you do this quality of work, but do it faster? And we look for screeners that can break even and provide a high quality of work. So we've got a few that are slower than the mark and a few that are higher than the mark. It all evens out in the end. Um, I believe the customs and stuff, uh, the custom yeah. boutiques and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but it's, it is, what's good is that it's kind of a team effort. So. There's not like no one person here is going to be able to, you know, no one screener or one person here is going to make or break anything. It's it's a pretty team effort. That's a pretty well oiled machine at this point. And the, and the two screeners before me are worth mentioning too because um, I learned a lot from uh, both uh, Angela and from Annie. They both right. were really great at this job, and they set the they made this desk uh, easier for me. So they both um, 
they both deserve praise for the job that they did here before I got here. I got really upset with a member after I had Angela, who looks like she, she's got a very young face. She looks like she's 16, but she was actually considerably older than that. I think she walks with a walker. Uh, anyway, no, I'm kidding, of course. But uh, Angela... Michael said that, in, Angela. Angela <laughs> no, she, she did a great job. Uh, but literally, her looks were deceiving. She looked like a teenager. Uh, and, and somebody called me up reaming me out after she was on an episode of taxi tv i don't want some kid like that judging my music blah 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 if they only knew how incredibly good she was so good as a screener that she got elevated to head screener and here you are this guy with you know an incredible resume and tons of experience under your belt giving her a tip of the hat so yay no, she did a great job no she did a great job as did Annie. Uh, yeah. Also, so I gotta say, yeah. you know, you can't judge a book by its cover, and shame on you if you do. No, both of them did great. Um, and, and going back to Jesse's question, have you ever used non-band members or non-musicians? People that just love to watch videos as screeners. What did I say earlier to you? I came in and read uh, this question. About an operation, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've got a daughter. My 21-year-old daughter yeah. is a little bit of a freak in that she loves watching surgeries online. It doesn't matter how bloody they are. Uh, she really gets into it, and she's got a stomach for it, and she loves learning about you know uh, um, physiology and blah, blah, blah. I would not want her sewing up a boo-boo on my finger because she's watched, She's a fan of those videos. So my question to you, Jesse, is do you really want fans judging your music? And I think that that comes from a place of, but my friends and family or people who've commented on my music online really love it. Yeah, but guess what? They aren't answering to Quentin Tarantino or the executive producer of a TV show. They're not working as a professional in Hollywood where their very career hinges on them making decisions that pair the right music with the right picture or picking the right songs for the right artist at a record label. There's, would you, would you want to be in a race where half the people driving the Formula One cars are fans? Right. No, you need professionals doing a professional job. Yeah. All right, so uh, this one's from Elliot, uh, real name Rick Elliot. I normally submit to EDM and trance instrumental requests, but I've recently started submitting to rock instrumental requests. Rock guitar is my first love. Don't tell your wife, Elliot. I mean, Rick. Uh, I've gotten forwards on my electronic submissions, but not one for any of my rock ones yet. Uh, I've really only submitted a couple, so I'm not really butthurt about it. <laughs> But I'd like to see, be more successful. A few different screeners have print, pointed out that my VST drums do not sound human enough. We already talked about that. Um, or the samples are not high quality. I'm not disputing what they're saying, though I spend a lot of time making sure they sound like the references and all the other forwards and favorites that are posted. Um, I think he means references. Uh, the question is, do you have a tutorial that you recommend uh, or a VST that would bring me closer to the mark, or any advice is welcome. Again, I'm not disputing it. I know a few screeners can't be wrong, meaning more than one screener can't be wrong. I'll be darned if I can figure out what I'm doing wrong. So basically he's saying he tries to use um, VST drums and using the latest and greatest, but it still sounds dated to the screeners. Um, is there, what would you recommend that Rick Elliott does to improve that situation? Well, okay, there's, again, you know, depending on what you're doing, uh, if you need live drum sounds, I mean, let's be honest, live drums are, they're a pain in the neck. You know, I mean, you need 13, I have, in my studio, I have like 13 microphones, right? Two rooms, two overheads, one wow. for the toms, two on the kick drum, snare top and bottom, hi-hat. So drums are a pain in the neck. You know, they really, I mean, you should do a video on that with your, with your old, with your analog experience, recording drums for all the great drummers you've recorded. That'd be good for, I would, wa I would watch that. I've um, got nothing but time on my hands. I'd love to do that. <laughs> so there you go. I actually, you know, one of the, one of the best things I did here, I, I don't mean to drop names, but uh, one of the best things I did as a drummer was Ed Sheerney, the famous engineer, was giving a, a 
video presentation on how to record drums. He was talking about EQing and the sound and the room mics. And I just happened to be the drummer in that video. Now it wasn't really? about the drumming. it wasn't about me. It wasn't about the drumming. I wasn't on there as a drummer talking to other drummers. I was just somebody there to hit the drums so that Ed Cherney could give a lecture. And it was at I can't remember if it was at Sunset Sound or Precision Sound or one of those big studios down in Hollywood off Sunset. Um, anyway, it was a high, one of the highlights of my life, and I didn't even really play. But as we started the video, we had to do a second take because. Um, I went in and I hit the drums. He, he had his engineers go mic him up and I hit the drums and uh, he goes, okay, uh, cut. And I'm like, uh oh, you know, like we're, we're like two minutes in. He goes, all right, listen, this needs to be a video about making bad drums sound good. So you're going to have to go back in and like detune these because I need something to fix. So he literally wow. just put drums on my microphone and he's like, okay, this sounds fine. I'm not, there's going to be no video here. So, uh, you know, there's there's been videos of, of getting great drum sounds out there. But as far as replacing a real drummer with VSTs, you know, you just got to be careful in sh certain genres of doing that rather than go that route. Um, I, I mean, I just think with the Internet now and so many guys that are just dying to play drums on your track. And I know it's a pain in the neck and I know people don't like hearing this, but there's what there's Fiverr. And what's that other place you recommended to me earlier um, where you can actually just get session air, pros? Air gigs, uh, yeah. studio one one. pros, there are a bunch of them. Or you can actually get a live person. Now, again, it's going to be more work, it's going to be more money, and it's going to take more time because it's a pain in the neck to mix 13 tracks of drums. It's it's not easy, you know. Um, but if you're going to compete and you're going to get music into a big movie – you're competing against people that have done that, that have a live drummer, that have live session players, that have those great drum sounds. So I applaud you for saying uh, I, I'm doing everything I can to get it right and it's still not right. right. You got to keep trying. And the answer is out there. And if it means somehow hiring a live drummer, then that's what you need to do um, to be competitive. Because I use live players as much as I can on all my recordings and it's how I got to where I am, not because of me. It's just because I've been smart enough to latch on to really some of the great musicians that I get to hang out with and work with every week. Um, it's made me better at what I do. And I've, I've learned about mixing drums from engineers. I mean, a lot of drummers that are great drummers, they're not necessarily great engineers. So I don't have all the answers as far as EQing a snare drum. I mean, I have a, I have a couple engineers on my block that are great engineers that have helped me with my own drum sounds. Um, so, you know, it, there's a lot to it. Um, yeah, I got to come over to your house one day. As uh, there's exactly. nothing I love more than getting a drum sound, and, and I'm not saying this to be braggadocious at all, but many of my peers back in the day would, you know, like book two days on the beginning of the album just to get the drums set up yeah. and sounding good. Yep. And I'm like, really? I I, I don't. The, I know that somebody will prove me wrong now, but I've never met a drum set that I couldn't get a great sound on in an hour or two. But there are things to consider. Uh, and, and even in crappy rooms, I, I've gotten a great, one of my best drum sounds ever was in somebody's parents' living room with like 60 feet of glass on one wall, river rock on, on, the, fi on the fireplace, wood on the floors and a wood beam ceiling and some carpet stone around. So we're able to kind of get a good blend of, of, of reflective uh, and, and you know, non-reflective surfaces. But I just use Sennheiser 421s and 57s on the drum kit. Normally I'm like using 414s and 87s as overheads, all these, you know, expensive mm -hmm. condenser mics. I literally just use um, Shure 57s and Sennheiser 421s and got one of my favorite drum sounds ever. And it was going into a Mackie 8 bus console and wow. using no compression whatsoever on any of the drums. I'll play no it for you. No, nothing. Wow. Literally, and you know the mics and the living room with the drum kit were kind of like seventy-five to a hundred feet away from me, using a long snake. So probably a little signal de degradation running through uh, seventy-five feet of analog snake. If I and I'll play it for you, and and got to remember it was done in like nineteen ninety-five, probably. But two things. Um, three things my opinion good tuning on the drums 
the better the drummer, the better the sound. I could take right. a, a really crappy drum kit and put Craig at it, and it would sound <laughs> amazingly better <laughs> than, than a twenty thousand drum kit, twenty thousand dollar drum kit with me playing it. I've got no touch. I've got no feel. Craig or any of the pro drummers I know would. I mean, I, I've recorded Steve Gadd, and, and seriously, you could go to Sears and buy one of those $99 drum kits to put a smile on your kid's face on Christmas morning and put a pro drummer behind that kit, and it's going to sound way better than putting an amateur in on a $20,000 kit. So number one, the drummer matters. Number two, tuning the drums and you can't tune them the same for every song i would yeah. generally tune them you know like do a one four five on the tom toms um and keep it there unless the song required like if it was a key where um the floor tom was featured a lot but that was also like the tonic note <laughs> of the song and you would lose the floor tom because the bass note is competing with the floor tom I might tune it up a third for that to, to make it pop more, um, which required me tuning the other drums to you know be in the one four five pattern with it. Um, what else uh, about getting a great drum sound? Um, tuning the drummer. I don't know. I'm out. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure I thought it had something. Oh, here, Elliot. I think your problem probably is that you're using a drumming style that sounds dated to when you fell in love with music. I swear to you, if I were programming drums, everything would sound like the Eagles, Crosby, mm -hmm. Stills, Nash & Young. Melodies are different. Drum turnarounds, you don't hear people doing doo boop boop boo doom boom That just doesn't happen anymore. So if that's what you listen to a hundred thousand times when you were in love with music and just listening over and over, you're gonna program doo boop boom boo doom boom into your into your VST and it's gonna sound old, even though the sounds on their own may have sounded cool and current. So if I, and Craig, you're a much better person to answer this than me, but I don't hear a lot of tom toms being used in records nowadays. Uh, and drum turnarounds. It just depends on the style. I mean, on country yeah. records and stuff, I think you will. But, you know, certainly pop now. And yeah, you're probably right on, well, I, I don't know what, what's come across the desk this week. But yeah, definitely genre specific. But yeah. back to what you were saying, you know, as far as getting those drum sounds too, like, Every, everything, all the instruments need to be represented in the mix, you know, so if they all have their, they all need to represent certain, you know, they all need to sit well for one reason or another in the mix. And I think if you address that as a whole and ref, A, B it with whatever the reference is, you'll, you'll come up with some, the happy, the happy place that it needs to be. Yep. Uh, and just so I'm going to tell everybody what I used to do on a snare drum. First of all, it's got to be a decent snare drum. Um, I'm not talking about a piccolo snare or any of those little four inch deep guys. I like a, um, remember the Black Widow snare? I don't remember who Black made Beauty. that. Black Beauty. Or yeah. Black Beauty, yeah. Yeah, lovely, yeah. My favorite snare, but it's not right for every kind of music. Like you couldn't use it on a jazz record, but you could use it on a pop record or on a classic rock record. Anyway, take a Black Beauty, um, just dampen, damp it down a little bit. I've told you guys on the show before, I stole this idea from uh, Ken Kalei. I saw him using it on uh, Mick Fleetwood's drums back in the day, which is take a, a feminine product, a sanitary napkin, not too thick, not too thin, um, uh, this is true, Craig. A and you great. make a, a hinge on the, the metal rim of the snare drum and take the the napkin <laughs> and, and put a quarter or a half dollar or a silver dollar on the back side of it. Tape that on with a piece of gaffer's tape. Yeah. And, and now you've got a hinged muffler with a weight on it. You hit the drum. Let's see if I can get this in frame. You hit the drum and it goes boom. Huh. Boom. So wow. it, it lets the ring come through when you strike the drum, but it comes down and kills the like 10 second after it. It All works right. great. So just that with a 57 on the snare, if that's the, the skin of the snare, the head of the snare, come in at an angle about like that. Try and get it angled like that on the drum, but avoid picking up the hi-hat with it so you don't get a lot of bleed. 
Um, sometimes it actually works to your advantage to mic it in such a way that you've got that angle and pick up a little bit of the kick drum shell. You get a little bit of tone from that and it works nicely. Um, I never used a compressor, I should say rarely, like 98% of the time did not use a, a compressor or limiter on the snare. Um, sometimes I would add 2 dB at 100, 2 dB at 5 or 8K, maybe 3 or 4, depending on how, you know, the snares were situated. If they were kind of loose and snary, I would add less on the top end. But if they were tight, I would add a little more on the top end and then roll off some low mids, probably somewhere between four and 700 hertz. And you kind of got to sweep through that depending on where the drum is tuned and how the new, new the head is. And that's it, no rocket science, you know, just a little bit of top, a little bit of bottom, lose a little bit of mid range, use a 57, and you will have a snare sound that will be in the ballpark of professional. I'm Agreed. sending everybody an invoice. That was there really expensive advice. There you go. Here's your engineering tutorial. <laughs> That's right. Uh, okay, this one's from John Granite. Um, are the letters A, B, C, B, A the correct paradigm for developmental arc? <laughs> gotcha. And I know why, because uh, a lot of people complain uh, when that box gets checked, this cue needs more developmental arc. And... Um, I have to get away from the drumming mindset a little bit to answer this one, but uh, basically with music, when we talk about developmental arc within a cue, it, it means that the music needs some forward motion. It needs to sound like it's progressing, it's going somewhere. And typically the best way to do that is a combination of things. It's not it's not just make your, don't automate, you don't write the same thing and then automate it louder so that you have a big crescendo. <laughs> look. I mean, that's, that's not what developmental arc means. You have to develop the track musically, and there's a bunch of ways to do this. There's no right or wrong answer, but there's a bunch of things you can do. That's why it's weird that we keep checking that box and people keep not making changes, because if your track is really busy, start it more simple so that you have some place to go. More simple, more sparse, leave yourself somewhere to build to. So you can build the track from starting sparse and then getting busy, going from whole notes to 16th notes, however you want to think of it. Um, the, the other thing you can do too is is add layers as you go. If you're gonna start with just an acoustic guitar, then maybe you'll bring in a cello, some bass, maybe some percussion or drums towards the end. That will help the developmental arc or the trajectory of it get bigger. So you can do it with, with volume. I'm not saying don't get louder, but that's just not the only way. You could do it with volume. You can do it by adding orchestration or more instruments. You can do it by density um, and you can even, uh, you know use a combination of all those things and i think there's a there's a sweet spot for balancing all those things um most of the time people either start too simple and stay too simple or they start too busy and stay too busy like that seems to be yep. the biggest offense right there is that they don't a lot of times when i was writing these critiques i'd be like you know start a little bit more simple either sparse or soft or with one instrument then bring other instruments in as you go um, but that's more what we mean by developmental arc. I don't think the answer for a good developmental arc is have an A section, then a B section, then an A section and a C section. It doesn't really go by that. If you, if you double up on your A section or go back and repeat it, add a layer to it the next time you do so that it's bigger than the first time we heard that section. So I don't think there's a, uh, an alphabetical formula to this. Um, there's not. And basically, I always tell people a, a cue is basically A all the way through and the A should be like a chorus from a, a song song. Um, and then somewhere in the middle, you're going to drop in a B section, which could be like an inverted version of the A section, just to break it up and give the editor a little um, someplace else to go if need be. And I want to show this, which I use. Oh, when there I do, you go. Yeah, when I do new member zooms. So as you can see, starts out kind of sparse. And I'm guessing this is probably, I don't know, four bars, four bars, four bars. I don't know, maybe these are each a bar, actually. I don't know. But you can see, it gets a little bigger, boom, edit point. And I don't mean a full, necessarily a full rest edit point. This happens to have that. And then here, it gets bigger and bigger, bigger, drops down. Um, this is probably the B section. So that's probably a couple of bars right there. And then in the end, it gets bigger, 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 crescendos, and then boom, out. So take a picture of your screen, folks.
Yeah, that's um, a good. That's a great picture of a two minute queue. Yeah, two minutes thirty. So I can't see what the numbers are. That's great. Uh, two minutes thirty one seconds. So this one's Perfect. a little long. Yeah, um, but good. not by much. And, and yeah, this is what uh, a waveform of a queue would look like. So, and I think that was from Dropbox that generated that waveform. Um, and, and that's not like the holy grail. They don't all have to be exactly like that. That's an example of something that's commonly used. Um, so there you go. Um, oh, by the way, uh, for all of you watching, especially, uh, well, no, all of you, uh, we updated your suggestion. Uh, you guys who are members suggested that we build a screener glossary. So when you guys see a critique from a screener that says um, it could use a little more developmental arc, and you don't know exactly what that means. Uh, so we took your suggestion to heart. We added probably 15 to 20 additional terms that were all related to that sort of stuff. And then we added it to the regular glossary, which you can find by going to the bottom of any of Taxi's web pages on our site uh, and look for industry, music industry glossary or something like that. And we've incorporated all those things like developmental arc in there or other phrases that the screeners commonly use. And we're, we're tweaking the critique form a little bit right now as we speak. In another week or so, uh, we should be done with those tweaks. One of the things we're gonna do is include a link right on the critique form so you'll be able to click over to the glossary to look up phrases like developmental arc right from your critique. So there you go. All right. Um, this one's from Matthew Levin or Levine, I think it's Levin. After being forwarded to library slash catalogs, how often are taxi members actually contacted for music deals? For example, I was contacted the very next day after my first forward a year ago. Matthew, you are the luckiest person on the planet. Your first, let's see, uh, yeah, the very, after my first forward, you were contacted the next day. That's extremely rare. Since then, I've had about 11 more forwards and haven't yet been contacted by a single one. Uh, this is totally just out of curiosity, not a complaint. Um, any thoughts on this, Craig, as somebody who's had music in libraries, who's dealt with libraries, and is also the king of all things? Um, <laughs> I don't know about that, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's completely random with what, you know, um, when a publisher needs music, they've got a lot of composers that are submitting music and, you know, uh, it just depends on their needs at that time. So, um, I've had, you know, they could reach out to you the next day, the next week or not at all in this case. So it's completely random. And, you know, the good news is, is that if, if this person got 11 forwards, as you say, that means that the screeners here at taxi obviously thought your music was good and worthwhile. So I would take that as a sign you should keep submitting because, that just means that eventually a publisher will pick up your thing, even if it, it, it's weird that he hasn't heard from 11 of those. I would think that that's on the more rare side. I would think I, I know why you. that is. I actually have an answer for that. Okay. Because recently Hollywood has gone back to work full force. The libraries are so busy filling the needs of the shows that are all my soup, all of my music library owner friends are all telling me exactly the same thing. We've never been this busy in the history of our company. Right. So they're busy pitching music and making deals rather than listening to the music that they're gathering up to flesh out or improve their catalog. So yeah. that's why. Yeah, it's, it's pretty random. Um, but obviously, if uh, if uh, you know the music was forwarded eleven times, that's certainly a good sign. I mean, you met the screener's approval, so that's great. What does it say? Write, submit, forget, repeat. There you go. Yep, that's it. That's it. That that phrase was uh, consecrated by our members. They made the the bumper sticker, gave them out at the road rally. It's good it's advice. It's true. Yeah, don't do the math. It, you'll drive yourself crazy. You'll get discouraged. Yep. Don't sit there and go, "Oh, I've been forwarded ten times and I haven't heard from anybody." eventually yeah, you will yep and in the time you take if you get depressed and lose momentum and for the next six months you really don't generate a lot of new music or submit a lot and then all of a sudden the dam breaks and you get three calls in a week then you will kick yourself in the ass for not being productive for the previous six months so That's right write submit forget and repeat 
Truer words never spoken. Um, this one is from Ellen Violetta. I read where Narada Michael Walden updated the tracks he did with Whitney Houston on Higher Love. I'm not sure this is the right question for this show, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What tips do you have for updating older songs? Oof, man, it's hard. I mean, if you have the individual tracks, it shouldn't be that hard because, um, you know, now with Pro Tools, Logic, Cubase, whatever DAW people are using, Studio One, <coughs> if you have access to the individual tracks, there's a lot you can do. You can remix the tune in its entirety. If it's just one stereo track, you can still have it remastered. But Narada Michael Walden, why would why would his tracks need to be updated? I mean, that's that was that's my question. Or what was the question again? Narada Michael Walden, because he was a great drummer too. Right, he updated but the tracks. He was tracks also a he, producer. So. Updated the tracks he did with Whitney Houston on Higher Love. What tips do you have for updating older songs? I mean, that's there are a million ways to answer that. Yeah, it depends on what you're shooting for. I mean, um, yeah, I, I'm not really sure how to answer that because, I mean, are you? Uh, why are you updating it? Was it? What, is it defunct? Did it go nowhere in its original state? Um, Do so you want it to sound tracks, more modern and less yeah, dated? If you, yeah. If you've got old tracks that have done nothing and, and the track itself hasn't been played or recorded by an artist or used on TV, and the reason is because it needs a more modern sound, then, yeah, go back and remix it and – and maybe add some layers to it. But um, yeah, the Whitney Houston thing strikes me as weird because I just, I'm usually, uh, I'm just <laughs> I say, curious why that happened. I had him as our keynote one year for the road rally easily 10 years ago. That man is a ball of energy. Um, I I'd never worked with him in the studio, but I had friends oh. that did. Oh my God, he, he's such an unusual guy, but unusual in a good way. And it's like, God reached out to the heavens and said, I'm going to take this unusual element and that unusual element and another yeah. unusual and cram them into one super talented guy. Yeah. Well, and he started his, I thought he started out as a drummer and then he became more known as a producer too. Yeah. He's really, really notable. I mean, he's had success in every aspect of his career. I'm a huge fan. I wish I knew more about the specific situation that this person was talking about. I don't. So I can't really. I'm not really sure what happened there or offer any advice to the contrary or, or corroborate it, but uh, I'm a fan of Nar Narada Michael Walden, so I'm sure whatever he did was the right thing. I'll leave it at that. Uh, I'm not sure I really understand this question, but I'm going to read it. Uh, I submitted three original compositions to a listing, and while all three were forwarded, I was advised that they weren't original, in quotes, compositions, but rather arrangements since the same lyrics titles had been used before in totally different musical compositions which bore no resemblance whatsoever to the ones that i submitted i mean i don't even understand what that means the commonly established definition as taught in every music school in the world as well as described by every dictionary is as follows arrangement in music traditionally any adaptation of a composition to fit a medium other than that for which it was originally written while at the same time retaining the general character of the original. What is your definition of an arrangement since it differs? Fun First of all, he's asking this question presumably to one of our screeners, so you or I couldn't answer it because we don't know what the... There's just no context for us on this... No, but you got to be careful with that arrangement thing in general because, like, if you can't just take a, you can't take somebody else's melody, chords, and lyrics and move it around a little bit or add a cello part to it and call it your own <laughs> arrangement. That's not that's not the copyright law prohibits stuff like that. So, I'm not really a copyright law or a public domain expert, but you know, if something calls for original work, especially from us, you have to have written it yourself and and not gone and like reworked something that's either public domain or legit or, uh, or you know you, you can't take existing lyrics and melody from somebody else and add a you know pad to it and call it your own arrangement I, I don't know I'm not really sure I understand the question in its entirety but um, I've read it four times and I, I don't really understand okay. it sorry okay. to say okay good <laughs> yeah I, I'm sorry, Goran. Um, I just don't really understand it. And, and it sounds like it's the question would be more specific 
to the screener who made the comment. Right. Craig might be able to help you if you could send him the actual copy, the actual critique and the listing it was for. Maybe he could help explain it to you because he would have some context. Yeah, um, I can research it a little, sure. Right. All right. Uh, and last but not least, and then we'll get into questions from the chat room. So if you're going to ask a question in the chat room, please type the word question in all caps before your question so it's easy to see when it goes flying by. Last question on this paper is from John Rossi, and he says, is it safe for me to post my copyrighted material on social media? Sure. You want people to hear it. Yeah, I mean, there's some libraries or some music supervisors that don't want your stuff out in the wild before they get their hands on it. Um, well, that's have, different because they own the, once you sign it to a library, they own the publishing. Technically, they own the song. So right. I wouldn't post anything of mine that's been signed to a library because technically I don't own it anymore. So, yeah, I mean, is it safe for me to post my copyright? In other words, if I own the music, yeah, of course it is because it's mine. But when you sign a publishing deal, you don't own the music anymore. So it's not safe for you to post it, even if you wrote it. You might be the composer, but if you don't own the publishing, you, you shouldn't be posting that music. Right. All right, so people are firing off questions here, but nobody's following that simple instruction I gave, which is type the word question in all caps. Here's one from Brian Steele at Olympia Music. Do you tune the kick and snare to the tonic? Uh, are there variations? I do not. Okay. Um, here's one from James Creasy. Uh, James, I don't know you. I love you if you're a taxi member, which you obviously are. Thank you for being a member, but I can't believe you're asking this question. Um, is every submission screened? Craig, head screener. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Not only is it screened, but it's checked by me and maybe one other person before it either gets returned or forwarded. So yes, it's heavily screened. Here's a comment from Andre Stepanian. Uh, had a free one hour session with Craig, which Andre won uh, for some sort of contest. Ah, the yeah. gentleman from Canada, yes. Excellent. Yes, uh, and one of the premier uh, fly fishing guides of the Western Canadian, uh, you know, of that part yes, of the country. Gu uh, guitar player, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, An incredibly excellent. good guitar player. Yes, like World yes, class yes. guitar player. Yeah, it was nice. That was good. Uh, that was, that and was fun. He, his question or comment had a free one hour session with Craig, uh, super fair, knowledgeable, helpful, and more. Oh, well, good. Uh, yeah. Good. Good. I hope he, I hope he got some publishing deals and some forwards after that. Yeah. Andre's a good guy. Um, question. Do the screeners use headphones or monitors or a mix of both? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I used both. Uh, and if I had anything in question, I mean, I, I have a studio, so my playback is pretty good. But I also used uh, good headphones, too, uh, to reference. If if the mix was in question and I needed to say something about the mix, I would usually play it back on two separate devices just to make sure that I wasn't that I wasn't getting inf tonal information that may have been irrelevant to the situation. Yeah. And when the screeners all worked under the roof here pre-COVID, um, they all used, uh, I don't have them. Do, can you read the model number off of your headphones? Um, Audio Technica AT30s or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we tested several headphones before we got those. And we don't try to buy like incredible sounding headphones because they're going to make the music sound better than it should. I personally like to use headphones that are kind of like NS10s, which they're, yep. they're good enough they're a little bit neutral, so you have to work a little bit at making a mix sound good on them, but they don't color it in a bad way. They don't color it in a good way. They just sound pretty good. Yep. Um, so now all the screeners are working remote because of COVID, and I have a feeling we have a hard time getting them to come back to the office, especially with current gas prices. Um, do you know it's actually it's $7 a gallon in some parts of Southern California right now? Could you imagine that? Seven bucks a gallon. It's at six forty nine a gallon at my favorite gas station. I saw that last night. Um, so the screeners working at home, um, you know, they're all industry pros. So they all uh, they're not working on earbuds. That I feel yeah. pretty safe in telling you. They yeah, these probably, are all in industry professionals. Nobody's listening on their iPhone headphones. Like they're, they're these people all have 
really nice studios probably 5.1 with a sub and had a good set of headphones so like i I've, that's really not a concern of mine i don't know if it is of yours you mean they're not listening to those the earbuds with the sequins on them they got at the gas right, station I, I guarantee you they are not <laughs> um let's see here's a question what percentage of forwards actually make it into libraries you know i don't know nobody knows it's an impossible thing and frankly i hadn't seen that question before but where did this go i was just working on member deals my lovely wife sent me the member deals to start editing those for the next newsletter um and i saw something oh here this is from a taxi member named john laplante from south hadley massachusetts um just finished up my fourth album usually an album in the in the the context of a music library usually means 10 or 12 tracks but it's not an album like you know whitney houston's putting out an album which she's not putting out any albums right now or ever but um it, it's not like an album for the 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 pop record industry but it's a collection of similar things like if you do dramedy or tension cues they a, a library might say we really like your work can you give me 10 of those um and some of that is motivated by it's just easier for them to sign one contract with one composer that's giving them 10 pieces of music so uh he said where'd this go i'm looking for it. oh all made possible by a single song forwarded to that company a year ago so he just did his fourth album for them Pre uh, he says th 42 tracks since i signed wow. since my initial contact with this library in october of 2020 the connection was all made possible through a taxi forward so when people say you know what percentage of the music gets forwarded or how how many things get forwarded what gets signed blah 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 there are a million ways to ask that question there's no way for us to answer because in this guy's case he got one thing forwarded that resulted in 42 cues making it into the library so technically yeah, i gotta think i gotta think sometimes we'll forward 10 things and all 10 will get signed and then I got to think sometimes we'll forward 20 things and maybe 15 will get signed yeah. or maybe 10. I don't, you know, there's no way. It just depends on what the library needs. And they don't, they don't give us an exact number. If we think it's good, we forward it. And we don't, you know, that's up to them to do the sifting after that. Um, yep. So. Yeah. And, and sometimes they may hear, you know, stuff that's like dramatically different Let, let's go back to dramedy cues for a minute there may be somebody that's really good at doing like urban sounding dramedy cues somebody else that does like almost goofy or circus like you know dramedy cues maybe with a calliope mixed in there or something so they may pick and choose from different people because they want to add variety to the library other days they may be looking for a lot of a, a certain type of drama EQ because they're on fire with a show right now that uses that type so there's just no rhyme or reason no way to predict it um next question nobody's typing anything with question in all caps nobody's typing any questions at all uh, e. Bizak says, love you guys and all the help you give me with the critiques worth every penny of membership. It's so funny how the vast majority of our members love the, the screeners and the feedback and almost everybody who gets into, um, you know, the member deals document that I work on every month. Um, so many of them comment about how great the screeners are and then you get other members like your screeners don't know their ass from a hole in the ground it's like but you're getting you're using the yeah. same company the ostensibly the same screener same listings i don't understand how there can be that i do difference. because the, the the you know when i first started in production music you know it's hard because you you don't want to hear that your music needs to be improved because you think it's great because you did it you know it's like how could something i did have gotten and it sucks it sucks getting that email back going your music was returned and you're like who are these guys it's easy it's just easier to go they, they don't know anything they're uh i did a taxi tv two or three years ago where they accused all of us of being old crotchety a and r guys from the 70s or something and i was like oh i wasn't i was i was 
I was born in 72. I'm not old and crotchety yet. I mean, I might be someday, but I'm not now. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, they were they, they accused us of all these things and we don't know. And I get it. I understand because, like, I've had my music returned. It sucks. I don't want to hear that. I want, I want to hear my music's great and it's awesome and people love me. Everything I do is awesome. And, and it might be, but it's not always right for every single listing. So uh, I, had a, I had an email the other day that said, uh, I for, again, I forget the exact wording because I deal with hundreds, but uh, somebody said, you know, I, I, I submitted something that was a hit and then they sent me a link to the very slick video. Uh, the video looked fantastic. And to be honest, the song was really good. They did like a reggaeton kind of thing with, it was really slick and they had like 200,000 YouTube plays and 35,000 Spotify and I, I verified all that and it was, it was true. It was a very good song, but they submitted it to something that wasn't that. So it's like submitting Stairway to Heaven to a dramedy queue. Of course it's going to get returned, you know? <laughs> it doesn't make Stairway to Heaven less of a hit. It just makes it like completely obsolete and off tune for this for what that that music supervisor needed. So I understand the people that it's it, when they call in and they go your screeners don't know anything, you guys are idiots, you wouldn't know a, compl- a, a hit if it hit you. I'm like, I don't know, you have you have screeners here that have hits, you have screeners that 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 have written orchestral pieces that have made it to trailers, you have people that have been in touring bands and i also get that too oh i've been a musician for 40 years and but i'm like that's great and then and and, but it's a different skill set and there's a learning curve to this just like when i got into production music i had been a touring musician for 30 years when i started that and it's a different skill set it it can translate over you can use that criteria you can use those skills they're very valuable skills to have but there's a learning curve It's like learning a different instrument. Like I would be useless as a trumpet player or a guitar player. Yeah, it's music, they're instruments, but mine's the drums. Now I have a degree in music, so I know how it works. I know how chords and melody and all that stuff works, but it doesn't make me a great trumpet player any more than being an accomplished drummer makes me good at writing TV cues. Um, I learned from a lot of composers. I, I spent a lot of time playing on sessions for TV shows. I did a lot. I did, and that's why that's, how I got my start in LA was doing those sessions for TV and film. Um, but as I was in the drum booth listening to the music, I'm like, wow, you know, I could really write this. This isn't, there's not, I, I understand what's going on here. And when I started, because I had that knowledge, because I had played on TV and movies, I was thought I thought I knew what I was doing. And there was some elements and some things, just like your members, like I met some of the criteria to do a good job composing music, but I didn't meet all of it. And my music would get returned and sent back to me. And people would go, Craig, this is good, but it's not what we're looking for. And it sucks. I didn't want to hear that. I, it hurts. But if you take that criticism or that feedback and you implement it and you make the changes and you and you learn to understand and hear the difference between what's on TV and what's not or what you did and what's on TV or what you did and what the forward sounded like, and you can actually identify that difference objectively, that's when you will start getting good at taxi. You will get forwards. You will get publishing deals. And this is within everybody's reach. It is not this magic formula brass ring that's out of reach for anybody. Um, you do not need a degree in music to be good at it. I mean, I have a degree in music, but you, I know a lot of people that are just as good, if not better, with no degree at all, that, that are really accomplished musicians that write great sync music. So um, the feedback that these screeners give you guys is really valuable. Um, if, if you digest it rather than fight it, I think you will find the success that you're here for. I really believe that. That's great. Couldn't have said that any more succinctly. Thank you for saying that so well. Uh, this question is from Stephen Elling, and he says, do taxi screeners reference a member's profile when critiquing a submission? No, they do not. Matter of fact, right now, I don't even think they can, right? If I'm not mistaken, I'm, I have I, no idea. Honestly, I found I out about a change we did to the screening process the other day that I signed off on a year ago. I had no recollection of doing it. If so. I'm not mistaken, they can't even see the uh, they can't even see the profile. So, wow, I'm sorry, I'm surprised that's such an issue. I mean, I, you know, people a, really I'm think I'm glad oh, I'm doing this. To, I'm glad I'm doing this to find out what what the real concerns are. It's baffling, but okay, sure. Absolutely. Um, I'm looking for another question. Uh, Chet Nichols, I'm not going to ask your question, but hi, Chet, uh, old <laughs> friend of mine, because uh, it's really more of a music attorney thing, not so much for the head screener. Um, talk about uses. This is from Eric Bryant. Um, 
talk about uses song as is, which is all in quotes, and does Taxi get a cut of this? So I think what he's saying um, is that in film and TV, they're not looking for a demo. They're looking for a finished piece of music that they can put in a show today, yeah. right now. Um, you can potentially... Oh, I see what he's talking about. Some of our listings, uh, I think there's one we're doing for a Korean company or a Chinese company or something, um, where they're looking for like American pop songs that then they will translate into Chinese or Korean, whatever the dialect is uh, or the language is. And if they use your tracks, like if they like your production enough, they may use your track rather than hiring a producer in a band to go ahead and build a new track. So you can potentially earn an additional fee if they choose to keep a production as is and they buy your entire song from you. So yeah, th that's true. Um, that happens, uh, here's a great example, it happened in America, not with a foreign uh, country or a, a, a translation to another language. Two taxi members, Adam Watts and Andy Dodd, uh, got some music forwarded to a young man named Jesse McCartney, who was managed by one of Carol King's daughters, who I knew, and she said, oh. can I run a listing for this? And she heard a song, Jesse McCartney heard a song and said, I really like their style, but I don't love this song for me. What else do they have? So uh, Carol King's daughter, Sherry, called me up and said, can you guys send over some other stuff by these guys? So we just connected the two entities. Wow. Jesse McCartney ended up cutting uh, Beautiful Soul, which he had a hit record with, and one other song from Adam and Andy, and he used their production. So it was a long, long wow. way around to get to that point. That's fantastic. Yeah, so not only did they make money as songwriters, but also as producers. So the answer to that is yes. All right, a few more minutes to answer a few more questions here. Ooh, I just had a big jump. Um, Here's one from Shane Steyer. I found myself prioritizing deliveries to listings that I can give more tracks because I figure libraries will be more likely to contact me. Is this a good approach? So he's choosing the things he submits to based on, I can make a lot of submissions for that one. Uh, is shotgunning a lot of stuff to a listing a better way to get uh, to ensure you're going to get a return phone call. Yes and no. I mean, it, it, here's the thing. Like, if 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 that's your wheelhouse, like, um, if you're really good at writing country music or dramedy cues or or the epic percussion or whatever, if you've got a lot of what you're good at, then yes. If you're just creating volume that you might randomly stick to the wall and get a four, that's not a good way of doing it. Make sure that everything you're doing is good. Like every cue that you're doing, go through it with a fine tooth comb, make sure it matches what that listing is looking for. Because that's what I'm going to tell you when you write in to complain after it gets returned. So read the listing, make sure that what you're submitting to each track you upload matches what they want. It's consistent with the references. Is the duration good? Is the instrumentation right? At the end of the day, is it the same feel, the same sound, the same approach as your mix good? If the answer for each one of those tracks is yes, then yeah, go ahead and submit 10, 20 things for each listing. But I know as a publisher myself, as a producer, as a player, all those things, I would rather have one track that is slamming and 100% than 20 things that are C+. Plus. Um, I apparently missed a bunch of questions. At one point, my, my uh, chat room just went sprawling and it probably moved three feet. So I'm going back and trying to find some questions to be fair to people. And you know what? I'll go an extra five minutes on the show. Are you good to go to 535? Great. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Um, this question's from Deb and Keith McCall. Just got a return because the piano sounded thin. I used a Mod X full grand piano, so maybe I messed with the EQ too much or... So... That's what they want to know is what might they yeah. have done using a That's top another notch. question we get a lot. You know, uh, if the sounds are bad, um, what's funny is that I found some of your other screeners are harder on the drums than I am, which is interesting because, like, <laughs> I've talked to a lot of the screeners and they're like, well, Craig, what do you think about the drum sounds? I'm like, I don't know. It sounds good to me. Um, but we get this with strings a lot. Uh, strings seems to be the biggest offender. And they say, oh, well, we use Vienna strings or East-West or whatever the big string patches this month. 
um, the big VST library. Um, sometimes it's not about the actual patch. Sometimes it is about the way it's mixed and, and, and curated. With strings, I know that seems to be coming across my desk a lot lately. And they say, oh, well, I have this, you know, $2,000 string plug-in, and that's great. But with strings, I've found, the big offense is when you play them on a keyboard, they still sound like, okay, they're great string samples, but play on a keyboard. They're not necessarily played as string players would do it. So there's a couple ways to combat that. That's probably a whole, so you should have a string player come on to talk about this. But one of the things I liked to do as a producer was I would record all the strings separately. My violas, my violins, my cellos, and my basses, and then pan them accordingly how you would set up an orchestra. So that's one way to do it. But the main thing is, is like if you're playing VST strings on a keyboard, no matter how good those strings sound, you have to like play them as string players would, not as a great synth player with great plugins. And the same goes for other sounds and stuff too. So yeah, the mixing is going to have something to do with it. But more importantly, if you're triggering a sound that isn't real, like if you're using a sample or a VST plugin, you have to approach that the same way the acoustic instrument would be played. That will be just as important as how the how good the initial sound or sample is. Um, and yeah, you can do things in post, compression, EQ, mastering will help. But um, if something sounded thin, specifically a piano, there's a lot of great piano sounds out there. There's really at this point no excuse for a piano to sound thin because like, well, I mean, if anything's been perfected in the box, it's piano. So yeah, something should be, you should investigate the way it's mixed in that. Uh, I or think. look for a phase problem. Nothing yeah, will make a piano yeah. sound thinner faster than being out of phase. So and you, you can get might... YouTube for a lot of these things. There's a lot, and plus, go revisit older Taxi TV episodes. You fixed so many problems on Taxi TV. I put that <laughs> at the bottom of my emails now. Before you email me again, go watch Michael's Taxi TV. He's probably answered this question before a hundred times, right. and it amazes me that a small percentage of our members watch this stuff. The people who watch it say, "Oh my gosh, this is gold! I can't believe how valuable it is. It's changing my life." Most of our members don't take the time. It's like, do you really, really want to be a professional in the industry? Because we're handing it to you on a silver platter. All you got to do is take it off and eat it. Um, this is not a bad suggestion. This is from Scooter, Scoot, Scootieri. When you receive your critique, critique, whether it's a forward or return, it'd be great if there was a link to the submission forwards because they're very difficult to find. So we do have a forwards blog, and generally speaking, people who watch Taxi TV know about it, but a lot of our members don't seem to know about it. So Liz, if you would make a note and hand that to me after the show, um, link to the forwards blog from Critiques. Um, although the forwards blog probably doesn't get posted until a day or two after the critiques have gone out. So Correct. we'll have to think about that. Um, I'm sorry, I, I must have missed some questions because people are saying you didn't answer my question. I'm really genuinely sorry, but uh, it, it skipped a whole bunch apparently and I just went back while Craig was answering that question and um, I, I could not find the people that were saying that they weren't in there. Um, all right, I'm going to find a couple more. Uh, Here's one from Chicago, Bob. What are of the industry? I think he means what area of the industry or what genre is the hottest right now for forwarding? We don't forward by genre. No, it depends. <laughs> you know, I get that 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 question to me a lot. I'm not sure why that comes to the head screener, but um, you know, what what is coming down the pike? What do we? You know, what's coming up next? What's the big hot thing to get in on? And we don't know. We we just respond to it. Like they come to us and say we need this and. <clears throat> And you run a listing and then we screen it and we send it to them like we don't we don't we don't kind of control the uh the pulse of what and i get that I, some people i people call in and uh, how come you don't have enough listings for this i have a ton of this and you never ask for this or how come there's not more label listings or more or more you know there's there's no acoustic guitar listings i'm like i don't i don't know we don't we don't control that we just respond to it you know 
And we actually try to control it a little bit in that if we see that we're going through a skinny period where we're not getting a lot of requests for singer, songwriter, or country, two things that we know that our members love, we will actually, uh, Tom will endeavor to reach out to a lot of companies that have run those types of listings with mm -hmm. us in the past. Are, are you looking for anything just to try and get our numbers up? But we can't do that for every genre in right. the world. Right. Um, you know, taxi is a reflection of what the industry is currently looking for. We don't control it. Yeah, it's more authentic if we just respond to the needs rather than create them, you know. Right. Uh, here's a question from Gloria Covington. I got a return from a piano and string cue. My cue had soft strings like the reference and piano at an equal volume, but I was told that there was no piano in the mix. I would say Send that's that a fake. Me, yeah. yeah, that's a yeah. phase problem. If there's yeah. no piano, it's one thing if like the piano was low in the mix um, or lower than the reference in the mix or something like that. But to say there's no piano in the mix, maybe yeah. when you bounced it, something went wrong or maybe something's 180 degrees out of phase. And All was right. that the reason for the return? Yeah. Um, one more question. I'm not sure I understand this, but we'll give it a shot. This is from Sherry, Sherry Lisa. Can a songwriter pull a song off Spotify slash Apple Music and then submit it for a forward-looking exclusive contract? Are there forward-looking exclusive contracts? I don't know what a forward-looking exclusive contract is. I think what they mean is if they already have the music out there for download and for sale, can they pull it off of those platforms to submit it to an exclusive contract? Got it. Um, yeah, but I would be careful. You know, again, if you were trying to shop it, I'm not sure putting it out there in the first place is the best thing to do. Like if you're looking to get a publishing deal, be careful about signing a non-exclusive deal because once you sign a non-exclusive deal, then you really shouldn't sign an exclusive one. So again, that's a separate taxi TV, TV episode for the way these publishing contracts are worded, but you can just be careful. I, somebody asked me a specific question like that a few weeks ago. And I, you know, before you submit anything to an exclusive contract, it's your job to do your due diligence to make sure that that track isn't somewhere else. And because when you sign it exclusively, that person needs to be the only person that has it. That's the definition of an exclusive deal. It shouldn't be out there on Spotify for download and in a non-exclusive library in a, what, what do they call them, the royalty free library? You don't, if you're right. submitting for an exclusive contract, it's your job to make sure that that piece of music is clear and available for those per those people to sign you. Um, it'll create problems down the road. And it also makes you kind of look illegitimate. It makes you look like you don't know what you're doing. If, if you sign something that they later find out and they hear it somewhere else, it can create problems. Well, I'm going to wrap up this show today, but you've been great. I love having you on the cool. show. I, I think people get, people get a really good behind the scenes look at the spirit of Taxi when they meet one of the key players on our staff. And... and you know, I, I know you, so I know that you're for real in how yeah. qualified you are to do the, excuse me, to do the job and stuff. But they don't, so I'm glad they get to meet you and and get to know you better. So it gives them a, a sense of confidence about who's handling their music, and you do a really, really, really good job of that. Um, I would love to have you back sooner than sure. later because I feel like there's a lot of stuff that I haven't gotten to today. Um, I want to let people know that we're going to do the top 10 on March 21st. That will be next Monday. We're going to do a top 10 episode. You guys always love those. Um, and then I'm going to do a quarantini. We haven't done a quarantini happy hour because guess what? We're not quarantined. I don't think anybody is quarantined, although I heard China is thinking about locking down again. Um, so we're going to do a, a, a quarantini just for the folks in China. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Chinese, but, right? Greg Carroza, we have some, actually, we do have some. Um, but Greg Carroza, uh, one of our members who's very generous contributing to the chat during Taxi TV episodes, and I've had him on the show a couple of times, um, he's going to be in Los Angeles. He, Los Angeles. He and his wife are driving here from Albuquerque for a Lakers game. Wow. 
Yeah, why? I do not know. I don't think they ever lived here, so they're not Lakers fans. I don't know, maybe, who, does Albuquerque have a basketball team? No, but L.A. could be somebody's bucket list where they just want to come and come to this city, and it's, it's a nice place with all of its imperfections. It's, it's, it's a good place to visit. That's right. I, I've heard that some of the homeless guys in the hood are opening up their tents for Airbnbs, you know. Might as well go for the full experience. Yeah, it's the only thing you can afford at this point, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Real estate prices here are crazy. Anyway, yeah. so Carosa is going to be here Wednesday, a week from this Wednesday, middle of the day, probably around 2, 2.15. We will send out an email letting you guys know we are at the mercy of the traffic gods as he's making his way here from um, Albuquerque. But I'm excited to have Greg on the show. He's a, a great contributor in the chat room as well as on the forums. So that's that. Uh, with that, uh, Craig Pilo, man, uh, I'm this really glad that, I'm glad that you work here. I'm glad that you had the time today to join me on the show. Absolutely. Everybody, thank you very much. Uh, everybody, see you next Monday for another extremely exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all.